Hello, everyone. Um, tonight, on behalf of our director, Professor Lionel Luquin, who has not been available to join us, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming all of you, and in particular, the delegation, U.S. delegation, led by, by Dr. Crystal Johnson, Deputy Director for Technology and Research Investments at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in the state of Maryland, with the participation of Dr. John Bolton, Associate Program Manager of Water Resources, NASA, Applied Science, Science Program, and Mrs. Terry Cochran, CEO and Longevity Expert Beyond Nutrition. Thank you very much for, the, for your presence tonight. So I'm very pleased to introduce you. And you, Dr. Crystal Johnson, you have also been the honor, honorary president of Women in Tech Global Summit that has just taken place in Paris during the last two days. As an advocate for women's equality, your personal journey is inspiring and motivating for the next generation of young women and male engineers and leaders who may one day, I hope, join the NASA teams and possibly set foot as Jean-Jacques Favier, one day, maybe, uh, on the moon or join the team that establishes and habitat on Mars. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and for your conference tonight on the activities of NASA and some of its major concerns, namely the environment and the place of women in science. So as you may know, these two subjects, women in science and environment, are particularly important for IMT Mine Albi. IMT Mine Albi is a major engineering school, part of the Institut Min Telecom, under the supervision of the Ministry of Economy, Finance and Recovery. It's a generalist, innovative, humanist and international school that combines science and humanities for an agile and sustainable world. These values have been historically anchored in the DNA of the school since its creation in 1993. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are implemented operationally at the school, in particular quality education and equality between women and men. It's in the art of IMT Minalbi's missions. Every day the school aims to raise awareness and initiate a lasting dynamic around the implementation of these SDGs for all of its staff and students as part of its teaching and research activities. It would be too long to present you all the activities, actions that our school implements. But here is a sample of our actions in support of our four missions. To train younger generations in the professions of today and tomorrow by constantly improving our teaching methods. Carry out high-level research on scientific questions with high societal and economic stakes. Innovate and contribute to economic development and disseminate scientific and technical information for science that is open and accessible to as many people as possible. As you may know, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit students all over the world, and in particular in France, by aggravating the precariousness of this part of the population. So in this context, at IMT Minalbi, equal opportunity is a reality that is appreciated at all levels, giving everyone a chance to go as far as possible according to their choices, regardless of their background, gender, or social origin, discovering scientific culture 
and demystifying higher education to overcome self-censorship are our daily will. So to conclude this introduction, the NASA has launched the Artemis program to return to the moon for periods longer than the 48 to 72 hours of the Apollo missions. In Europe, European Space Agency and the CNES, via the Spaceship Project, are part of this approach. In particular, CNES in Toulouse is developing a research axis around in-situ resource utilization and is particularly interested in the manufacture of parts for use by astronauts on the moon. The Clément Adair Albi Institute in our school is at the heart of this European spaceship project. Our school participates and contributes to the spaceship project, the objective of which is to create, to create a future lunar and or Martian base. This will be possible thanks to all the takers, makers and innovators that are contributing to make space exploration an opportunity for equality, empowerment, women empowerment and innovation. Thank you for your attention. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Well, bonjour. Oh, I've got a raise, yes. So I am so happy to be here with you today. Very, very happy. And I'm really happy to see so many young ladies in the audience here. It is wonderful for us to have both males and females, because if you're really about innovation, you've got to have all kinds of outside the box thinkers coming to the table. The people like us who do this for a living have been accustomed to doing things one way all the time. So when you come to the table and, and you look at our problem and you say, why are you doing it this way? Why don't you just do this? We're like, I'll be daggone. We should have thought of, about that. So it's really good to have diverse thinkers, people who are not living the same kind of life, people who have very different life experiences, Etc. So when you think about NASA, and I'll use this little clicker here, when you think about NASA, what is the visual that comes to your mind? The first thing that you think about when you think of NASA? Space. If you, if you close your eyes and you see a, a picture, what is the picture that you see? Somebody say it loud. A moon, okay. Rockets. Yeah, okay, so most people think about people, ooh, what was that? <laughs> it went black, oh, you all can see it, I just can't, okay. When most people think about space, they think about astronauts floating out on the International Space Station, people floating in, in space, and those types of things. There are many people that understand that NASA stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So they know that we do research in materials where we're thinking about new structures for the planes. We're thinking about sensors that can actually morph the aircraft. So when you're flying and you run into turbulence, it actually does a shape shape shift. It shifts the shape of the plane so that you can reduce the turbulence and not have so much noise for the passengers inside. Also, we're doing research on hypersonic travel. So being able to travel from the United States to Europe in maybe two hours instead of the long time that it takes right now. Right now, I mean, people have done hypersonic travel, but there's a big problem with that hypersonic boom. And when you're flying over houses, it's so loud, it rumbles everything. So until we can solve that problem, which you guys could help us solve, when you can solve that problem, you can actually fly over you know, commercial you can fly over people's homes, and you can get anywhere you need to go very, very fast. So we'll be looking for your help on that. So today, I'm going to shift your view just a little bit. So all of the things that you thought about when, when I said the word NASA, I don't know if any of you know the extent of the innovation engine that exists. 
not just with NASA, but with any space agency, but especially NASA. So this is what I get to do every single day, which is why I think I have the coolest job on the planet. I get to really think about the missions of the future, shape the mission, missions of the future in astrophysics, studying the, the stars, heliophysics, studying the sun and the effect that the sun has on us on the earth, planetary science and earth science. How do we live and how do we survive and how do we thrive right here on planet earth? And then we get to invent whole new technologies or mature the technologies that we've got so that we can actually do those cool missions of the future. So we are right now, all of us are in a situation where we are reliant upon the earth. We have to live right here. We can go up to the International Space Station, but we got to come right back down. So what our global space community is working on together is using the moon as a proving ground. So we're going back to the moon, but not just for a visit, but to have a sustainable presence there. I mean having living stations on the surface of the moon and testing out the technologies so that when you get ready to go to Mars, you can make sure that something works. Because if you go straight to Mars and you have a problem, then there's nobody that can come and help you. You're just kind of stuck. So we don't want that to be the situation. After we do that, we're going to actually have a real sustainable presence on Mars, either on Mars or under the surface of Mars, because you have to have some kind of protection from the solar, from the sun that's going to come there, and the radiation. Because if we, you know, we landed a man on the moon as a global space community, if that had happened only one week later, all of the astronauts would have died because we had a solar flare that happened that next week. And when you have that much radiation and you have no protection around you, it will fry you. And so we have, to, we have all kinds of solutions that we've got to come up with before we can send humans all the way to Mars. A lot of work to do. So once we get to Mars, this is where you all come in. There are so many different inventions that have to happen to make this work. We've got to have suits and materials that will keep people safe. So the material work that you're doing is really, really critical. We've got to have aircraft that can fly. We've got to have rovers and, and transportation on the surface. We've got to have living accommodations. How do you grow your food there? How do you make sure that the water is clean and you can recycle water on the surface of, of Mars? There are so many problems and challenges that you gotta, we've got to solve. That's where you all come in. So it's not about floating out there. It's about looking at the real problems and challenges that we have to face and then really addressing them. One of the cool things about this is when you have an impossible mission and you're creating new, uh, new missions in astro, helio, earth, and planetary, we've had to develop new technologies every single day to infuse those into those kind of missions. And so right now, at my center alone, I have about 10,000 people at my facility that, that I'm responsible for. We have flown over 450 successful missions that are still up there. In order to fly those particular missions, there are thousands of technologies that we've had to develop. But what's even cooler than that is that we take those technologies and we transfer them to private industry so that they can commercialize them and turn them into something totally different that improves the quality of life for everybody on a day in and day out basis. And so that's where I really wanna shift your attention and your focus because you are the kind of audience that really would be able to appreciate when you're, when you're spending your time studying and doing engineering, there are so many applications and, and people can take the NASA technologies, create companies based upon the work that we're doing. The sky is the limit, and actually the sky is not the limit anymore. You all probably know that. For example, NASA is in your life in so many ways that you don't even think about. Technologies that we've developed and transferred to be able to help everyone. For consumer goods, if someone came to us, and there are many people that come to NASA and say, I've got this problem, can you help me with it? And that's where I get excited, because I'm like, hmm, if you have a problem and you tell me that it's, it's impossible to do, I'm like, okay, <laughs> thank you, because I don't believe in no such thing to do something. And, and my whole team is all about totally debunking that, totally denying that that is the case. And so 
when, when you work at NASA and these kind of, we're the best place to work in the federal government we, at, in the United States. Uh, we have a survey every year, and out of all of the agencies, we always come in first place, and that is because we really enjoy what we do. So when I was around your age, a little bit older than you, and working at NASA in the summertime, um, we would actually go out on the boat and bring our laptops on, on the boat, and I was designing and building laser systems for remote sensing in the atmosphere. So we have a problem, we're trying to figure out these new materials, we couldn't get it to work in the lab. We go jump in the water, swim, and everything else, and then come back when we come up with a solution. But for this, someone came to us and said, hey, I want to be more healthy. Do you have a way for me to put my food in the, in, the, in the stove before I leave, keep it cold as a refrigerator, and then when I get ready to leave work, use my phone to turn the, the stove on, have it cook my food, and if I decide I want to stop along the way home, just put it on warm and let it just wait for me, and then when I get home, my food is ready for me to eat. We were like, okay, we can take that challenge. This particular stove right here serves as a refrigerator and a stove with a warm sensor that is remote control operated. And so that's available commercially in the United States. Has anyone ever heard of the company Speedo that does swimsuits? So Speedo came to us and said, hey, you all do a really good job looking at drag and friction reduction. Could you help us with a swimsuit that actually reduces the drag and friction for our Olympic swimmers? And we were like, sure, we can do that. So we worked with them to develop the LZR racer. And as soon as that came out, the first month after it came out, there were 13 world records that were broken in the Olympics as a result of our LZR racer suit. And then when it comes to public safety, and I, we really literally have done a thousand of these kind of examples in just one year. That is the kind of thing that we do in terms of innovation. When it comes to public safety, in many re remote areas and local areas, you have drinking water that's not very, very pure. So on the International Space Station, how we actually keep the water clean, they have respiration that gets collected, their sweat gets co collected, their urine gets collected, and we put it through a system on the International Space Station that has these incredible filters that filters 99.98% of the bacteria and everything else out of that water so that they can actually drink that water. So we can use those filters in that system in very remote locations where the water is very contaminated and we can provide drinking water to whole communities in remote locations. And for us, we had a problem in the United States. There were people uh, in college that were having football practice, and I mean the American football. And what happened is it was a hot, hot day and one of the football players had a heat stroke and he died. And so there were a lot of people that were really concerned about that. The very next week, we had a professional football player, I mean the next week, who had a heat stroke and he died. And so then the media and everybody else got involved saying, why are you all making these players go out in all this heat and, and getting them in this kind of trouble? Don't you know when they're in trouble? So the NFL coaches came, that's a National Football League, coaches came to us and said, how in the world are we supposed to know when someone's in trouble? When you're outside working out, you're going to be red, you're going to be sweaty, everybody is. So how do we know somebody's in trouble? So we said, okay, we can help you with that. So in order for us to monitor the, 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 the um, astronauts, we, had, we developed a digestible thermometer that they can actually swallow and it goes down into their gut and monitors the core temperature of their body. So if there is elevation or, or you know, a reduction in temperature, you know exactly what's going on. So we've transferred that and the firefighters are using that. So when you go into a hot spot and their temperatures get elevated, they know they need to bring a helicopter in and remove those, those firefighters immediately. For those people that do deep sea diving, when you have one of those thermometers swallowed and the people are back on the boat, you go down too low and you start getting confused because you're, something's happening with your body and your temperature starts starts to drop, they know that somebody's got to help pull you up because there's no way you're going to have the, the sense of mind to even be able to come up and you will actually have a real bad time down there if you're not brought up. So that's just one more example of the technologies. And in health and medicine, we had two doctors that came to us and said, we have several people that need a heart transplant and especially young kids. 
and at this point in time, their heart is so weak, it's not strong enough to pump the blood all the way through the extremities of their arms and their legs. Can you help us develop a pump that can actually pump the blood all the way through the extremities while they're waiting for a transplant? And we said, absolutely, we can help you with that. So we developed this particular pump, and it has now been in over a 1,000 human beings helping to save their lives and keeping them alive while they're waiting for a heart transplant. So the sky is no longer the limit. And for us, if you can conceive it in your mind, you can definitely achieve it. And that is one of the reasons that I have the most fun job on the planet, all the way from outside to inside. Now we're gonna focus a little bit about Earth. We're gonna bring it in a little bit and focus more on the planet Earth with John Bolton. Thank you, Crystal. How would we arrange the... Even though we work at NASA, we don't... It, things are still complicated for me, so... Things are still complicated. I can't work the mouse. How's it going, y'all? I'm John. So. <laughs> So yeah, we're going to bring it down to earth just a little bit. So one of the, uh, a lot of times when I, I tell folks like, hey, I'm, I'm John, I, I work at NASA. What do you do? Well, I'm a hydrologist. What's that? Why well, study, I study water. You know, water on Mars? No, actually I study water on earth. NASA's doing stuff on earth science? Are you kidding me? That's a very fun part of my job. In fact, we are doing this. So today I'm going to talk about water security and, and food security. So. Raise your hand if you ate a, a meal today. Hopefully everyone did. If you took a bath today or a shower today or yesterday, there. So this is relevant to you. <laughs> well, some of us only took one yesterday. So, so I'm going to start with this cartoon. Okay, if we go back to uh, you know, middle school, right? This is, the, this is the hydrologic cycle. This is the earth as a complex interrelated system. And if you look at everything on this picture that is blue and green and white, that's related to water. That's what we're here to address. And our job as scientists and water managers and protectors of the earth, just as Dr. Uh, Johnson just mentioned, is to manage these resources as effectively as we can. So essentially what we need to do is track the movement of water, energy, and carbon through this complex interrelated system as effectively as we can. So a traditional way of doing this is you go out into the, your yard, you put a thermometer in the ground, you can tell how warm the soil is, you can take a picture of a tree, you can see, see how, how green it is. That's great. Unfortunately, it's, it's difficult to do. What if you're interested in, in looking at your entire town or your entire state or country? Or how about the entire globe? Well, it turns out that one of the best ways of doing that is from space. So here's your first quiz. Who knows what this picture is? Yeah, so this is in fact the first photograph ever taken of the planet Earth. This was taken in on April, let's say October 24th, 1946. And some folks in, in put a camera on a Delta II rocket in California, shot the rocket up into space, and they got lucky. The, the rocket fell back down, and they had this picture of the planet Earth. And they, initially, they were all upset because it was cloudy, and they're like, all these clouds are in our way. I'm a hydrologist. I'm thrilled about the clouds. So if we fast forward just a few years, I know that you've seen this picture. This is, considered, this is called the blue marble. In fact, it's the most, most reproduced photograph in human history. And this is when the, um, on, the, on the Apollo mission in 1972, the astronauts turned around and they took a photograph of the planet Earth. This is a very, very awe-inspiring photograph. In fact, when, when astronauts view the Earth from space, they experience something they call the overview effect. They have a paradigm shift in their thinking. It's such a powerful experience viewing our world from such a different vantage place. But how do we observe the Earth from space. So we use the electromagnetic spectrum. So I know, I know you all know what this is, but essentially 
the rainbow portion of this, this figure is what we see with our eyes. But that's a very, very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, if we leverage other regions of the spectrum, we can detect things such as soil moisture using microwaves. You can actually see through trees. It's still, it blows my mind that you can just, you can see through vegetation, you can see through trees. We can detect snow, ice, rainfall, vegetation. Not just a type of vegetation, if there's a, a, if there's a corn plant here or a soy plant here, we can actually detect the health of that plant. We can use something we call the, the Fraunhofer line. It's a very, very narrow range of this band. We can detect a flux. It's actually how much energy that plant is using from space, from thousands of kilometers up. It's, I still get impressed by it. So if we fast forward, so NASA is doing this, as, as Crystal Johnson just mentioned. So we are Earth fleet, just the portion of NASA's fleet that is looking at Earth. We have 18, more than 18 satellites that are looking at different parts of the water, energy, and carbon cycles. So this is all great, this is all super fun and fancy, but what do we do with it? So I'm in the Applied Sciences program. My job is to make as much, most use of all these cool technologies and cool tools and tool, the cool observations as we can. And I target hydrology. So what we're, we're interested in doing is see how we can address very, very important problems such as drought forecasting, reservoir operations, and different things about water. Not only where the water is and where the water isn't, but also the quality of that water. How that water affects us through extreme events such as flooding. And I'll, I'll show you some examples here in a moment. This is a very dear to me. I live in Ellicott City, Maryland, and it's, it's, it's I've been the victim of, of some very extreme flash floods lately. So we've, this is an example of near real time flood damage. I won't get into this right now. We can also detect groundwater. And I love talking about groundwater because I get to talk about grace. I love grace. So we have a satellite called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Okay, you're detecting groundwater from space. How do you do that? You're actually not looking at a satellite flying over looking down at the ground. You're actually using two satellites flying in tandem, following each other. So let's say my, this, uh, this remote, just ignore this, that I put this thing on a timer, obviously I'm not that fast. So if this, if this thing has mass, say this is a mountain, the first satellite will be pulled forward just slightly. But what the two satellites are measuring is this horizontal distance. And get this, they're separated by 200 kilometers and they're measuring this distance within the accuracy of one red blood cell. Blows my mind. So this horizontal distance changes because the first satellite gets pulled forward. And so we can infer a movement of water if we do this month after month after month. This gravity anomaly tells us how much groundwater is on the ground. And we can use this. If we, if we use this as an example from Dr. Matt Rodell from a nature paper in 2009, just looking over our Northwest uh, any region. And you can see this significant trend just from these changes in gravitational observations. And we see this movement of water. And you see this trend. Does this look like a sustainable trend? It's a downward trend. Most of their agriculture in this region is sourced by groundwater. So this is a way where we can work with international partners and help in increase their decision making. So they have a more informed way of managing their water and resources. We also look at irrigation. It's really cool. We can say, how much water are you applying to crops? How much water is being lost by crops? So you can measure evapotranspiration. This is a combined evaporation from the ground and transpiration from the plants. We can detect this from space. That's pretty wild. Okay, so how do we do this? I don't know if this thing's gonna, gonna run, but just imagine it's this beautiful animation. Oh, there it is, it's beautiful. So it's moving. So this is the GPM, or Global Precipitation Mission. And what it's doing is telling us observations of precipitation every 30 minutes on the planet Earth. Now as a hydrologist, this is a game changer. If you're a hydrologist and you're responsible for water resource management, you really want to understand how much precipitation is falling. So when this mission was launched, just recently, it was a game changer for hydrology. The same for irrigation. So the, the key with NASA 
as Crystal mentioned, is having this com combined multi-sensor observations of the Earth and a long legacy of observations. When you have a long legacy of observations, you're able to tell a story. For, and a story that no one's been able to tell, ever. So here, this is from, uh, this, I think this is in, in Iowa, from uh, several years in 1990 to current date. And what we're able to do is look at changes in land cover and changes of how that water and land cover has been managed in the region. Now, I really love this, this animation. So if you're familiar with Bob Ross, Bob Ross was the painter, the guy with the, the cool hair. I think he would love this. But all this was, we just, we just overlaid two observations. One is the observation of soil moisture from the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. And that's in the, the warm colors. And overlaid with the GPM, soil moisture, or precipitation. That's all it is. There's nothing fancy. And this tells a story. This tells the story of precipitation memory. We're able to look at this and see when there's, when there's a rain, rainfall event, that rainfall, that water is captured in the soil and it's reflected in this, in this animation. And that's the, the key. And that's what's really, really cool about NASA. We're able to tell the story of Earth. We're able to tell the story of this, inter, this complex interrelated system of carbon, water, and energy. But it's not just cool, fancy figures and, and fun movies. It's about translating this to actionable information. And we do this by working with folks like you. And that's the whole key. We have data, and we integrate this data in a meaningful way. We do things such as crowd or crop yield monitoring and informed decision making. Now, I'm not going, I, I couldn't if I tried, I couldn't steal ter Terry's thunder, but she's going to tell you some amazing facts about, about food in just a few minutes. But I, will, I would like to highlight a few more key pretty cool things we're doing. This is called OpenET, and I encourage you all to go and Google OpenET. This is something we've been doing. We've been partnering with a lot of, of folks looking at evapotranspiration using cloud-based services for providing information for farmers who need it. They can get this on their cell phone, and they can tell how much water is being lost by their crops just from today or, or yesterday from their phone. We're also doing this on a larger scale, looking at global like GeoGlam. This is the GeoGlam monitor and some other examples. So I have another test. You may, you may remember, look at this figure, it may look familiar. This is called Moore's Law. Moore's Law essentially holds true. It's the theory that every two years, the number of transistors in a circuit would double. And pretty much this is held true. We're seeing this increased trend in complexity of, of instruments. Does anyone know what this figure is? You're gonna, there's lots, there will be a test after this, I'm just telling you. This is the ENIAC computer. This is also in 1946, the same year that the first image of planet Earth was taken. This computer was considered the first general purpose computer, quote unquote. The ENIAC would not even fit on this stage. It was so big, okay? So this computer was built just 76 years since then, my cell phone is more than 230 million times faster than the ENIAC. Isn't that wild? So why are we doing this? If you look at this figure, this shows an increase in data storage at NASA alone. From 2015 to 2025, they're predicting what we'll need. I'm not, I'm not really sure what a petabyte is, to be honest with you, but I know it's big. So this is petabytes of data that NASA is using. But the key here is in, in applied sciences, a win for us, a win for NASA, is to help inform decision making from partners all over the world. Unfortunately, regions that are water insecure and food insecure lack the ability to store data often. They don't have complex data systems. So we're, we're really embracing open technology, open science, and cloud-based services. And most importantly, we're working with partners. We're listening and learning. And that's what we're doing. So we'll talk about my story later. I think we're going to do that. But right now, I, it's my great pleasure to pass the mic to Terry. Thank you so much.
also need technical assistance. <laughs> I am not a scientist <laughs> at NASA. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to go this way. Good afternoon, everyone. So delighted to be with you all. The last time I was in a college classroom was just a year ago when my youngest daughter graduated from Duke University. And her guilty pleasure, as she calls it, is astrophysics. Although she ended up having a public policy, a computer science, and a legal rights uh, degree. And now she's working in artificial intelligence in policy. So I want to ask each and one, every one of you, how many of you think you're powerful? And I'm not asking how strong you are. That's a different kind of power. How many of you think you are powerful, that you have the ability to make a change, to make an impact? Anybody? Oh my goodness. I do. I do. All right, me too. Me too. Okay. Well, <laughs> I hope, and I'm holding, and especially after we all finish talking and dialoguing, that each and every one of you leave here today just understanding how powerful you are, okay? And that's my commitment to you. I'm gonna do everything I can to let you know how powerful you are, and then I'm gonna ask you for your commitment to say, with that power, what are you gonna do with it, okay? Is that a deal? All right, wonderful. All right, so just a little bit more about myself, okay? I am, I am not a scientist, but I became one through a need of my son. I was in international finance, doing billions of dollars of asset tranching and risk managing and moving assets and uh, real estate finance, but my son was very ill and no one could figure him out. So I took a skill set of how I manage a risk scenario and I decided to become a curious observer of how I would get my son well when every model in medicine was failing him. And, and so I did. And he's 28 now, and this was when he was three. And so I started doing research outside the halls of academia. Academia gives you the foundation and the structure, but I also encourage you to be a lifelong learner. I have continued my learning for over 17 years. This is my second career. I was in a 20-year career in institutional finance. Now I have almost a 20-year career in personalized medicine, wellness, and fitness. Does anybody know Mike Tyson? Anybody heard of Mike Tyson? I helped him get back to the ring in 2020. Okay, that's the power of my one, and that's just one story. Okay, okay, yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did, John. Um, okay, so now I have your attention. <laughs> so I took that curious observation and I started learning how patterns evolve the patterns of the body, the patterns of biochemistry, the patterns of epigenetics, the patterns of quantum biology, the patterns of quantum physics, the patterns of energy, because we're understanding that we are molecular beings driven by energy, okay? And so is our planet. So I want to talk about why am I here sitting next to these two esteemed scientists? Because we need each other, okay? As a curious observer, I also then developed the Global Sustainable Health Institute because we have to live in a sustainable earth so then we can go and find Mars and live there too. And so I wanted to share a few things with you around how we are so similar with our earth. We share the same mineral structure. As a matter of fact, quartz shares potassium, silica. Silica is so important because it is a structure that helps us communicate internally, our biochemistry, magnesium, potassium. The majority of the surface of the water, as John showed, is made up of water, as are we. And our circulatory system is similar to the tributaries of our rivers and our oceans that keep us alive. Okay, but I wanna share some dramatic truths and I don't want you to leave here feeling depressed because there is hope and I'm gonna leave you with hope and I'm gonna show you how much power you have, okay? 2021 was one of the warmest years on record. That's rising air temperature, ouch. Today we were walking around in this beautiful city and it was hotter than it has been where we were, we were told that, wow, this doesn't usually get this hot until October, excuse me, July. <laughs> Oceanic temperatures are also rising, and the oceans, they take up a third of our carbon emissions. We also have the lungs of the planet, the Amazon forest. 
The Amazon forest is now 20% gone. And in some parts of it, in the southwest section of the Amazon forest, it is now a carbon emitter instead of a carbon protector. That's very scary. So our two major carbon sinks are on fire. And as a matter of fact, yesterday, John and I spoke on a panel on the food systems on fire. And that's really why I'm here, because I'm all about food. Food was the thing that was almost killed my son. It was the thing that almost saved us, that did save his life. All right. So here we go. I told you I'm not very good and I can't see what's going on there. So let's talk about pollution in our oceans. All right. We have 8 million tons of plastic waste in the ocean every year. Every time you throw away a water bottle, that water bottle that is plastic will last 450 years. It will go somewhere. And that water bottle, those plastics, will leach into the fish, which then leach into you when you eat the fish. And also what they're saying is by the year 2050, we're going to have more plastic than fish in our ocean. That's worse than the McDonald's fish fillet. <laughs> Do you all know McDonald's? <laughs> if you don't, that's a good thing. <laughs> also, the preservatives in our food... The preservatives in our foods contain preservatives. We, we walk, the average American walks around with 30 preservatives in their body every day. And the soil conditions, 95% of the food that we grow on this planet is made up from our topsoil. Almost half of that is gone. And we are, we are actually losing it 10 times faster than we can grow it back. And glyphosate, which is a very big pesticide and herbicide, is still sprayed in over 100 countries. This is a known carcinogen, a known endocrine disruptor. It messes up with your hormones. If you all want to consider having children at some point in your life, please consider what you do when you take in glyphosate. It can make you sterile and worse. Okay, so let's look at why I'm here and why we're talking about our co-partnership with NASA and how we change and turn this around. Why? Because energy, industry, agriculture, transportation, forestry, and waste is all related to food. By the year 2050, food, the food system, will account for 70% of all emissions on the planet. Emissions cause greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases raise water temperature, raise air temperature. That kills our coral reefs. That further depletes our um, rainforest. It depletes the ability to grow crops. That's why we need scientists like John and Dr. Uh, Johnson to help us figure out how we can get out of this hole. We can and we will, and the power of one is going to show you how. All right. So the effects and consequences of what's going on in our planet, right? We have rising temperatures. We have bleaching coral reefs and the death of the Amazon. And the decreased availability to access and uh, for food and med medicinal resources, we have over 100 plants in the Amazon that are used for anti-cancer drugs. One out of four individuals on this planet rely on the Amazon, and it's the benefits for how they make their income. And most of all, it's leading to natural disasters and natural disaster within us as epidemics and obesity, diabetes, chronic illness, autoimmune disease ensues, okay? And that is not just being ill. If you're ill, you can't go to work. If you can't go to work, somebody's gonna have to pay your insurance costs and you're not producing for that company. As your insurance companies rise, you become a greater risk to that insurer. If you become a greater risk to that insurer, this is my finance mind, then it's gonna cost you more money to be insured. It's a vicious cycle, which takes more money out of your pocket, and you, can't, and you can't be well, more money out of the GDP. Are you guys getting it now? Yes, very good. Okay, so we are so connected that the World Health Organization has called climate change the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Okay, I want to pause there because I want you to take this in and, and really, really digest it and assimilate it. It's the single biggest health rate facing humanity. All right, so let's see what we can do with that. So we know what we've talked about, malnutrition, nutritional diseases, cancer, endocrine disruption, so on and so on and so on. So where do you come in? Let's find out. 
as soon as my computer tells me where we are. Uh oh, here we go. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to walk you through a day in your life. A day in your life of the average college student, the average American, the average global citizen, if you live in an industrialized country. Okay, so the average person takes a 20 minute shower. Okay, that's, that takes 17 gallons of water. But when I wanted to share, which I didn't before, is food waste is huge on the global, on the global scene. Food waste accounts for one quarter of all our water use, and it's 30% of all the carbon emissions. So when you don't eat what you're buying, whether it goes into your trash can or the groceries, the, the grocery stores and the delis can't sell it, they have to waste it, it goes on the, our landfills, and it's one third of our carbon emissions and a quarter of our water use. Okay, so 17 gallons of water. Hygienic products, so the three Bs, parabens, phthalates, Okay, BCPs, those are what we put on our bodies. So we're taking a shower, it's taking 20 minutes, now we're using our beautiful conditioner, it smells really good, we're, we're uh, wearing soap that has parabens in it. Where do you think that runoff goes into? Where does it go? It goes into the water. And where do our fish live? And the, the plankton and the coral reefs and all of these species, where do they live? Do, they, do you think they need shampoo? Not that kind, right? <laughs> and then we get out of our shower and then we most likely as a college student, you're gonna buy, you're gonna buy packaged food, right? And that packaged food is gonna have preservatives and it's going to have food coloring and it's going to have plastic because if you microwave it, then that plastic is gonna leach into your food, which is a poison. So remember we carry 30 chemicals in our body, right? And then you're gonna, how many of you are here from University of Mississippi? I know that there were some, yay, all right, go Mississippi. All right, even though I was a gator. Um, okay guys, so if you, if you were thinking, oh, I'm gonna be really healthy and I'm gonna go to the, let's say Kroger or Publix, whatever food, uh, whatever uh, grocery uh, chain you guys know about, I'm gonna buy a good strawberry. Well, guess what? That strawberry, even though it costs, that single strawberry costs you 30 cents, it also costs 76 gallons of gas to get it from California to Mississippi. How expensive is that strawberry? Whoa, that's scary, right? And your kids are gonna be paying for it, it's not just you because we now know that the toxicity within us is multi-generational because it's passed on through our DNA and that's the work of epigenetics. We are expressing our DNA in the wrong way through our environment. All right, so let's, let's see where we go from here. All right, and then we go we probably at travel, if we do an average of 39 miles a day, more gas, and then we go to dinner, fast food, the package which goes in the landfill. Are you guys getting it? Getting it now? All right, so this is where you come in, okay? So, the power of one. Each one of you can make a magnificent difference in the future of our planet, in the quality of our soil, in the, right, in the temperature of our air and our water, and in, in your own biochemistry, because you're here to learn. But if your biochemistry is altered, and I work with a lot of mental health, I work with a lot of autoimmune diseases, I work with cancer, I have an internationally known practice in the DC area. We, see, we, see, we call ourselves a last stop saloon because we get the cases that nobody can figure out. And I've developed a methodology that helps us figure it out, okay? But we don't wanna do that. I don't wanna have to be, I wanna retire soon. I want, I want people to be healthier, all right? So the power of one, okay? What can you do to make a difference? If you, if you just reduce your shower time from 20 minutes to five, you're, you're saving 15 gallons of water every day, okay? If you use clean, sustainable products, you're not leaching that poison into your water system. Share, ride a bike. Use reusable products, bring glass containers. When you go to Starbucks or whatever coffee, Coffee's really big right now, and I, I consume it daily too. I love, does anybody know Bulletproof Coffee? Anybody know that? Dave Asprey, okay, well that's a really big product in, in the US, his coffee's very clean. I, I endorse that one. Um, he's a friend of mine actually. So, so but bring, bring a container with you. Think about, I want you to think about every inflection point during your day, what choice will I make? Will I choose to be a steward of my planet 
and it doesn't take more time. We just have to be a little bit more planning. Or do, will I choose to be a legacy of what you saw in that drought picture that John showed? All right. Okay. And this is, this is the cycle of everything. Our choices, our food, our waste, our transportation, our food, our synthetics will increase the carbon footprint or not. What is Earth's response? We treat it the way it treats us. And I know that we have the power to reverse what we're seeing today. All right, oops, we don't need citations, but if you do, there's a lot of scientific citations that we can share with you. Okay, so how many of you think you have the power to make a difference? I hope everyone in here, if not, you get to hear it again. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So now is the time for you to ask any questions that you want to ask of us. You have an opportunity here to really ask whatever you want to ask. So anybody have a question for any of us? Was there a hand? Where? Oh, go ahead. You have to project. Or get a mic. Oh, she's bringing a mic. Okay. <laughs> oh, good, thank you. Okay, I hope that works. All right. So, um, I was wondering, in the book Martian, the main character could grow potatoes there and other vegetables to survive. So, which plants would be able to survive on Mars, and which conditions should be ensured to do that then? Yeah. Yeah, so all of the vegetables could be grown on Mars if you have the right conditions. So you saw the potatoes being grown, and that was because that's what he had, and, and he had the right kind of soil, I'll say moisture and uh, fertilizer that would actually help it to grow. But you can grow some of anything um, if you have the right conditions. And the right conditions mean you have to have water, you have to have some kind of uh, base for it to grow in. It doesn't have to be soil, because you've heard of hydroponics before. You can grow things in other materials, but we really would love to have the soil, because also in the soil do you get the nutrients. And so you're really big on the nutrients, making sure that you have all of the nutrients that you've got to have, the minerals that your body needs in addition to the food that you're putting in it. And so that's a very good question. So I have the next question that uh, is actually related to the last one. So uh, are you sure that uh, there is going to be enough water and that the solar can be found or created on Mars in order to oh, yeah. provide all of the resources needed? Absolutely. So like here on Earth, whenever there is a volcano, so I'll say that Mars used to be a very active planet, just like the Earth was. There used to be oceans, there used to be an environment where you could actually, I don't know if you could breathe it healthily, but there was an environment like here. Something happened there that made it this desolate red planet that's very, very dry. But we've been doing research on Mars. We have rovers that are roaming around on Mars. We can actually take samples of the soil. We know that there is water there. But also, on those active planets, there are volcanoes. And when you have a volcano, it actually digs tunnels under the ground, the lava digs tunnels under the ground. And what we have found when we have those tunnels, the lava tubes, in those lava tubes under the ground, we know that there is ice. So what we're looking to do, with you all's help, and I'm gonna keep saying this because I would love to have some of you help us solve some of these problems, there will be robots that go under the ground that have cameras attached to the front of them and be able to go into those, we practice here on Earth in mines, in very, very desolate places. But they will be able to go under the ground, they'll look for the ice locations, and then when we find you know, locations that have quite a bit of ice, then we know we can actually have a habitat, a habitat an inflatable hab habitat that is close to that because then all you have to do is melt the ice and use that as a water source and just use some of the filtering that we know we've, we can do to purify that water and use it as drinking water. And then, you know, whenever there is a solar flare or something, you know, very large amounts of radiation that come down, 
we'll all have these handheld devices or, or sun visors with a readout on it to let us know that there's about to be a solar flare, to let you know exactly how much time you have before it reaches Mars. And then we, we'll need your help in, in coming up the, with the next generation of GPS. Because as you know, around the Earth, there are 31 satellites floating around the Earth, and you have to triangulate three of those satellites in order for your GPS to tell you where you are right now. Imagine having to put 31 satellites around Mars to be able to do GPS and locate ourselves. So we've got to come up with some creative solutions for that. There are these things called pulsars, which are those stars that rotate really, really fast so precisely that it's just like an atomic clock. And it's just like a lighthouse. So it's very, very regular. And there are thousands and thousands of pulsars out there. If we can actually, and you know, there are people, there are nations that would love when you're in wartime to disrupt your GPS signal so that it, they can cut you off from your supply. They can cut you off from the support that's coming during battle time, during wartime. So if you can create a way to have GPS without satellites that can be disrupted and use the stars instead, then you can triangulate three stars and you can do intergalactic travel very, very precisely, and no one can interrupt that signal. So there are so many of these far out capabilities and technologies that will be developed in order for us to truly live on Mars. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, I'm very curious. Yes. Um, so we didn't get the end of your story. Um, how did you find out what your son got? And um, thank you. Um, how is it possible for you to find out what the other uh, sick people would have? As Dr. Johnson says, had said in her presentation, when somebody tells her something's impossible, we, we, we bulldoze through, we make it possible. So I, I consider myself a Renaissance woman, right? I'm, I'm a Cuban refugee, so my first language is Spanish. We came to this country without any, any resources, without the language, there was no E. This country, I apologize, the U.S. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in France right now. Uh, and so one of the things that my family really taught me, and I really want you to bring this home with you today as well, is that you're never measured by the quality of the clothes you're wearing, the amount of income that you make, or even the, your vocation at the time. If you have the, the resource within you to know how powerful you are. So I knew nothing about medicine. I did real estate deals, very big real estate deals, and I managed the risk for, I worked at Freddie Mac. Have you all heard of Freddie Mac? It's one of the largest institutions in the US. I ran one of their departments for managing the risk of their multifamily assets, billions and billions of dollars. However, I knew what risk was. And so I was a pattern recognizer. And what I also knew is my son, that he had idiopathic, meaning they don't know what was, was going on with him, but by the age of three, he had the bone density of an 18-month-old. He wasn't walking, he wasn't talking, he had life-threatening asthma, he was having brain seizures. And in that time, under traditional medical models, and we live in the D.C. area, so I had Georgetown University, have you heard about that? Johns Hopkins, have you heard of that university? Children's Hospital, have you heard of them? We did too, but they weren't helping us. So I finally made the decision. There was a little voice in my head, and this is another thing. Please listen to that voice in your head, that internal knowing. What if it could be different? What if my child is not relegated to this life of being broken? And that's when I decided, okay, no internet at the time. I couldn't Google research myself into what is idiopathic failure to thrive, I had to go look it up. I had to go to libraries, I had to go talk to people. I would look at every child in his preschool and see how they were growing and see how my son wasn't growing. And there was one little kid who grew from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And I talked to that mother and she says, there is a doctor who's really interesting, Dr. Patricia Sebastian Armstrong, who ended up being my mentor. 
and it was functional medicine. And so she was the one that found out that his body was breaking down because he was born premature. His endocrine system was breaking down. The steroids that were, they were giving him were making him sicker. So that was the genesis of my journey. And I will tell you, the son that would be broken in high school was valediction speaker. He was a junior Olympic gold medalist. He was a varsity swimmer. I'm very proud of him, obviously. <laughs> He's 28 now. Not broken. Any other questions? Still with it. While she's taking the, micro, the mic over to him, I will tell you that also with these other challenges, all of you are aware of COVID. All of you are dealing with COVID. We were dealing with COVID in a major way. In the United States, we had so many people in the hospitals, they didn't have ventilators. So people were dying because they couldn't get the ventilators attached to them to help them with COVID. At NASA, we developed our own ventilators that actually didn't use the same supply chain as the commercial ventilators did so that we could come to the rescue and help save lives. Right now, I'm currently working with people to develop a COVID breathalyzer where you can just blow into the, we, we have these sensors that we're sensing stars millions of miles away. They're so sensitive that they can actually, you have volatile organic compounds that come out of your breath every time you blow. And certain proteins are in that breath. We can actually uh, tune those sensors so that you can pick up the volatile organic compound that you know two days after you've been infected, you know two weeks after you've been infected because it's a different protein, and then two months afterwards. And you can tell if you have COVID in just 15 seconds with just one blow. In addition to that, this kind of material, you can tune to different things like diabetes and do a blow test to know if somebody has diabetes right away. You've seen people who have uh, seizures and they have to walk around with a seizure dog and they say the dog can smell it if you're gonna have a seizure. This, this breathalyzer is an electronic nose. So somebody can blow into that and know if they're about to succumb to a, a seizure. And there could be other, several other cartridges. You just plug in a different, go to your drugstore, get a different cartridge if you have a certain ailment, and then use the breathalyzer to help you with whatever that, that sickness is. So these are all the types of things that you do out of need. Not that you're doing it because that's part of your job. It's just a need that comes up, just like with her. Yes, sir. Uh, in recent days, uh, recent months, there are companies like um, your Origin or SpaceX that begin the space program, like uh, some people on the, like, uh, in space. And what's the product of you on, on this company? What's the, the expert of which company? Uh, like um, SpaceX and um, oh, SpaceX. Origin, your Origin. Yes, yes. So SpaceX has expertise in building rockets. They also have expertise in building spacecraft buses. And so that is what they, that's what they bring to the table to help us with quite a bit. Um, there's a huge commercial industry that brings so many different elements to the table to help the whole global community because all of us have space companies that are working with our space agencies like CNES, which is where we're going to visit. I'm excited about seeing that here in, yeah, in Toulouse when we go back. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a question for uh, Mr. Bolton. Uh, it was stated by the United Nations that uh, nearly six, billions, uh, six billion people will suffer uh, from a scarcity, no, clean water scarcity by 2050. And this is the result of different reasons, like uh, uh, population growth, uh, economic crisis, and uh, reduction of water resources. So, does NASA have any views on this issue? Great question. Yes. So, in fact, that same, that same report also highlighted that water is the number one threat multiplier in the world. Number one threat multiplier in the world. So, what NASA is doing through the Applied Sciences Program, as I mentioned, is leveraging our observations and trying to inform water management particularly in transboundary water regions where it's critical, this movement of water. So the key is trying to 
characterize, understand, and predict each portion of that water movement as frequently and accurately as possible. This is really, really, really tricky, okay? Especially in regions that have, there's political tension in these transboundary regions. If you have an observation of stream flow, you can tell how much water is flowing. But what if your neighbor doesn't want to share that information? Okay. And or what if their, their uh, instruments fail? And so what we're doing, we're partnering with many, many different groups, including uh, USAID, the World Bank, and other countries who are addressing this. And the key is, is working together. And so NASA is, is working very strongly to build a capacity for, for different countries, all countries, to leverage NASA's data. And I love, I love this, this part of when people say, well, well how much, uh, you know, SpaceX, you know, you can, they, have, they have data available. All NASA data is free. Everything that NASA produces is in the public domain. And it's my favorite part of this job. I love it because it's so cool, especially when you're working with international partners. So the key is getting information into the hands of folks who need it so they can manage their own water resources more effectively. And it's, it's so important. It's so important. And we really are at, this is the golden age of remote sensing. I've, I've been saying this for years. When I was studying, when I was in school, I love my, my advisor said, you know, one day, one day there will be a, there will be a mission that, that detects soy moisture from space. Guess what? That, that mission was launched in 2015. That's the Soy Moisture Active Passive Mission. And, and I've been so lucky to be involved with that mission. But it's changing lives and it's changing the way that we relate to water. It's changing our relationship to water. It's changing our relationship to food, as Terry mentioned. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Question over here and over there. Uh, so NASA is developing a station and basis on Mars. Does it mean that uh, the future of humanity uh, will not take place on Earth? Wow. So that is an amazing question. So that really depends on you. It depends on all of us here. So there are so many people, okay, I'm just gonna just be blunt. There are so many people that get wrapped up into political positions one way or the other. Either there is climate change, there isn't climate change, and all of that. If we get to a place as a human race, human race, that we decide we are going to take care of our planet, then we will be able to live here forever. If we decide that we would rather let money be the most important thing, where people get richer and they pollute the environment and they don't care, then we are gonna get to a place very soon that it will be so polluted here that we will have no choice but to go somewhere else. So the answer is, it depends. Yes. Yes. And if I may, a fantastic question. And I, I did, my goal was, I reached my goal with, with, uh, you heard me, um, I, I, I believe, in asking that question. And so this is really incumbent upon all of you, all these beautiful minds that are sitting in front of us today, right? When you asked me that question, how did you figure out your son? Because I wanted to, because I had a passion, because I took everything that I had learned and I kept learning from it and I started drawing relationships. How will this work? How will it not work? You all have this incredible capacity within you to really make a difference. And we are told, and we work with some of the best climate people on the planet that are actually uh, forwarding climate solutions. They were on our panel, on uh, other panels in, uh, with the Women in Technology Forum uh, in these last two days. And so we don't, this is not a hopeless place. This is a place of action though. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, don't think about how you're gonna how you're going to think or what you're going to act like in two years. It has to be done as you walk out this door. And not just with your own personal power, but what can you do? How, what, can you, what conversations can you all start having as scientists, as bright minds, as 
technology thinkers that are way beyond what I had when I didn't even have a Google computer to try to figure out what my son's endocrine system was breaking down. Okay. And I'd like to take that one step further. You all have the ability, and I'm really hoping, that you are truly our leaders in the future. We need people who have the kind of intelligence that you all have, not just kind of people who are, they would just love the power, but people who really understand what, what the kind of things that we are doing, the, what kind of effects they will have on, hum, on the human race. And so if you could have any influence whatsoever, take that opportunity so that you can make a difference. Because if you don't, then we're just lost. And we need for you all to lead us in the future. I'm going to be on a beach somewhere, and you all are going to have to be the leaders. There was another question. Some, oh, yes. So uh, I had a question about supporting life on the moon. Uh, the moon is a very hostile environment, so yeah. I was wondering which uh, technologies you were pioneering to make sure that uh, humans could uh, live on the moon uh, long term. Oh boy. So there's like a list of a hundred, and there's another list of a thousand that still need to be pioneered. And so you have to make sure that you've got uh, things to, to be able to purify the air, because we have a certain amount of ratio of, of chemicals that we have to have in order to breathe. You've got to have housing. So think about the materials that have to be developed if you want to live above the ground, like we live above the ground here. If you don't have something that can withstand all of the radiation that's going to come from the sun, then you've got to be underground. And so think about the above ground, think about the fact that right if we go to Mars, which was the most similar thing to where we are here, and we can, we can explore new planets and, and see if there's another Earth-like planet that we could survive on. But if you want to live above ground and you want to fly without the environment, then that's another whole set of equations you've got to solve in order to be able to fly without the environment. Uh, and so many other things. You've got to be able to grow food. Now, if you're underground, that's another whole set of problems that you've got to deal with um, because you have to be able to pipe in air. And, and, well, if there's not really air, then you've got to figure out how to do circulation of air. You still have to make sure that you're protected from anything that could leach down through the ground or soil. You've got, uh, there are so many things. How do you get the power? There's nuclear power. There are other kinds of power. Um, you could have solar, but there could be problems with that when you're in a totally different environment. And the list goes on and on and on. We have a question Thank over you. here. Two questions over here. Over here in the front. In the blue shirt. Wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of inhabiting the moon and Mars, I am pretty sure that maybe eventually we can get to the technological advancements we need to do that. But my question is regarding the political aspect of it, because I'm expecting that Everybody, everybody wants their uh, their piece of the cake. So, how does politics play into that? Is it possible that someday we are able to go there? But wait, that country wants to go there, and that country wants to go there, but they uh, they conflict, and so we end up not going there at all. You. you are really smart. <laughs> <laughs> really smart. I don't know if you've been seeing what's been happening in the news with some countries. Yeah, but yeah. And so what is happening is, all right, let's see how to say this. Um, you have some countries that want to work, like think about the, the United Nations where all the countries come together and they develop these rules. And almost all of the countries are willing to follow those rules so that they can continue to be a part of the United Nations, right? So there are some countries that say, huh, eh, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and that's that. What are you going to do? And we say, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to not send gas to you, or we're going to you know, cut you off from this or that. So imagine if we are having a nation 
that is the first one to get to Mars. Or if we're going to really develop a, a, a sustainable presence on the moon first so we can test out all the technologies and get everything ready, let's just say we have a country that decides they're going to go to the moon first and they're going to say, we are here and then we're not going to allow you to land. We are going to cut off your communications and once you land an astronaut on the surface over here, we're going to cut them off completely. So they can't communicate back with you, and our astronauts are actually attacked, let's just say. So there is a possibility that nations can weaponize going to these other planets. And they can weaponize communications back to Earth. They can do so many different things. So as we design this, the, international, the, the International Space Station of the future, Artemis and, and all of those that we're in the process, are, we're all working together on that right now. Um, we have to design it with the, uh, with the thought in mind, it is no longer like the days when our astronauts used to go. There's, uh, you know, to the International Space Station or to put the first foot on the, on the surface of the moon because it's a very different environment that we're working on, working in. And so we have to make sure that as many nations as possible go arm in arm, and that we have agreements in place, solid agreements in place, that there are significant implications and ramifications if they do not keep the agreements that all of the nations come up with. Because you can have your way up there, but then all of your citizens on the ground will suffer if you break those agreements, those accords. And so it's, it's something that all, so we had the National Space Symposium just um, so in May in Colorado. So we had your country, we had Australia, we had Japan. All, every one of the spacefaring nations came to that, organ, came to that meeting. All of the heads, the head of Kness, the head of ESA oh, even was up there, JAXA, US, all of the, the space, DLR, which is Germany, Canada, all of them were there except for a couple. And so all of those heads asked that, they were talking about that same exact thing and talking about what kind of accords do we need to make sure we have in place in order for all of us to benefit and for all of us to be able to take us to the next level when it comes to space fair nations. And so it is a really important discussion that you just brought up. You just really pulled on a serious nerve that the heads of all the space agencies are worried about. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. And I just have a question, uh, I think, on, the, on the, all the three fields, yeah. uh, mostly about water and water as a human right. Because I think since 2010, the United Nations agreed that water should be actually a human right. And, I mean, yeah, for everyone. Uh, but still, to this day, every, one of every three people in the world has an access to actually a safe, uh, safe water network. So before going into another planet and actually messing the scarce resource that either with climate change or pollution or just because of our own, uh, of our own human uh, mind, I would say, uh, how can we assure and actually put a value into us a resource that's fundamental for enjoying life at its, uh, at its fullest? Great, great question. So, and I like that. I like that you brought up the the, the sort of statistics of water because it's changing, right? So, when I was born, I think the the population of the planet was, was roughly uh, six billion people, right? So I have a, I have a nine year old daughter. By the time she's my age, there'll be an additional two point two billion people. Billion on our planet. So we're going to reach 10 billion people when she's my age. And so what's that, what's the effect on food and water and water relations? Everyone's, every single, every single person here, your relationship to water will be different in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years than it is right now. I guarantee that. And I'm not saying that to, in a scary way, it may be better. 
you know, we're seeing all these technological advances. I loved the COVID story. I, I didn't know about that. So we, what we're doing, what I'm seeing is right now, we're at, a, we're at a tech university. We're seeing how we are able to embrace technology and weave it into our, our lives in a healthy way, in a meaningful way. So addressing water management, okay? So the, the idea is we can't bring more water. We're never gonna have more water on the planet, right? We are seeing a change in the water cycle. We're seeing a speeding up of the water cycle. When you heat up the atmosphere, it can hold more water, right? And what that does to this water cycle is essentially speeds it up. So you have more intense storms and changes. So that changes where the water is. It's also changing how, uh, how the water evaporates. So you're gonna have more intense droughts and floods and, the, and stream flow. Okay, this is all kind of scary stuff. I try not to paint such a dire picture of, of the world because what I've seen is we have, we've made great advances in our ability to, to monitor water just from our, our black and white blurry photograph from 1946, fast forward just a few years, and now I can tell you the, the height of a reservoir within the accuracy of three centimeters from hundreds of kilometers up. I can tell you the movement of water and groundwater from hundreds of kilometers altitude. Um, and we can also measure the mass of, of glaciers. We can measure the mass of all these things. So as far as like management, water, management of water and, and, and keeping track of this precious resource, this is what, this is a major, the major priority for the NASA Water Resources Program, which, which I'm, I'm working for at NASA. And what I'm seeing is we partner with agencies all over the world great young minds like you and you guys you're going to be amazed all the all the cool ideas that folks are going with with how to manage water we're we're embracing ai we're embracing multi-sensor technology we're embracing and what's really neat we've seen in the last few years taking an observation of from a satellite and integrating that in a strategic way with socioeconomic data and why this is important because that is how you, you can address how water influences you, right? So it's not just, is there water here? Okay, this, this chair's black, this and that. It's about, well, you know, what, what about the, the population, the change, the, the health, the nutrients in the food, all these things. So I have hope because I've seen how, how NASA is, is helping push the envelope, take this technology, but more importantly, connect with folks who need it. And, and why I'm on that note, uh, I'll just say that connection has been a sort of a theme over the last few days at the, at the WIT. It's been very, very cool. Yesterday morning, I, I was trying to get an, an Uber to the meeting, and three, uh, three women saw me standing there like a lost puppy. They're like, come over here, get, get, in, our, get in our Uber. And they, they, uh, they're just like, what's your LinkedIn information? I was like, I don't have LinkedIn. I don't, I don't know. I don't do that. I'm not on LinkedIn. <laughs> what? And they took my phone and they installed LinkedIn on it. They're like, boom, boom, boom. And so they put it. But the point there is that my job, which I love so much, is connecting with people, talking about science, and letting you all know that we have resources to help you have a better understanding of what we're doing and so that we can have a better understanding of what you're doing. Again, great question. So I'm going to put on my hat from my first part of my life in the finance industry, okay? We have to incentivize. Incentivize a profit such that everyone on the planet does get water as a human right through private-public partnerships, through technology research, through Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology that's going to allow us to, I mean, people are spending millions of dollars on art in the NFTs, why can't we create and incentivize, because we're driven by motive and profit as it, the human nature, right? And so I'm really hopeful, and we have some partners at the World Bank, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Dita Sethi, who runs Climate Nexus and Food Waste at the World Bank. She's also a PhD in economics, and she is hopeful that by incentivizing private-public partnerships, where we're actually creating commodities that is good for all is the way out. 
So I see we have a question. Do you have a question here? Okay, I, I won't answer that because I think we're getting close to the time, right? Yeah, okay, so last question. Uh, I've got a, kind of a philosophical question um, about power and responsibility. Um, do you really believe that uh, you and I, as individuals, we have the, the power to change, really change, solve the global warming problem, or, and if not, uh, don't you think that shifting the responsibility to the individual uh, may be distracting us from the companies and governments that are really responsible for it? Great question, and I think we should all answer this. So, I believe it starts with the power of one, because it's like a microcosm in a cell. If you look at, I'm gonna do cellular biology now, so back to my current um, fun in my brain is every cell has to communicate with the other cell, but there has to be a catalyst for that communication to ensue. And so it's that, the power of Gandhi, right? The power of, of one into Martin Luther King, right? It was just one person. The power, now John F. Kennedy was a president of the United States. He said, we're gonna put a man on the moon in 10 years. It was one, one voice, but that was a catalyzer we can't do it just by ourselves because we're ecosystems by our very nature. We have to exist in connection, but it is a catalyzing agent. And when we think about taking action, that action has to become a practice and the practice becomes a habit. And so when you habitually do something in your own personal being, you're actually creating an energetic flow through you that is different. It's a frequency change. And so that might be these women that found John. He was lost. His frequency, there was a lost frequency. <laughs> and they noticed that he needed some help. So that's a great question. I think it's, it is a combination. It's a combo platter, as I call it. It has to be a yes and. But if we don't take action, then we may never start the catalyst. Well, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time here with us and engaging us so fully in these question and answer sessions. It's been fun for me and fun for all of us, I'm sure. So thank you. Thank you very much.